So, as I said, today we're going to discuss how we can continue to drive advertising engagement. And actually, Christian uh, set us up perfectly for that. Um, you know, with the growing proliferation of devices, which we've discussed, fragmentation of platforms, uh, increasing move to paid for services, and monetization becomes increasingly challenging, particularly of the younger demographics. Uh, we have more complexity, we have many more business models, many more ecosystems that we have to work through. Uh, so to help me discuss these issues today, we have uh, Matthias Berg from TV4, uh, who's the Chief Operating Officer, has held roles at Viasat, TV3, TDC, and UC. And last year he told us about how he turned around uh, the TV ad decline in Sweden, which is quite a big claim to fame, uh, to fame uh, while growing Bonia's digital uh, products at the same time, and we look forward to hearing more about what you've done this year. We have Christian uh, Kurtz from Viacom, who is responsible for corporate and consumer research uh, and insights for Viacom globally, uh, following students at Discovery, Disney, ABC, Warner Bros. and Republic and ITV, so quite a varied background. Uh, and in addition to his Viacom hat, uh, Christian is a member of the ECTA board, so he can provide us with a European view, potentially, of the disrupted value chain. We have Stefan right in the middle, uh, Stefan Jensen from uh, Mindshare, who's the video director there. Uh, he has worked across all verticals to launch big TV uh, campaigns and has now taken his expertise to video formats outside TV. So he can give us a more holistic view of the audiovisual uh, landscape. We have Nick Callahan from Facebook, who heads up their entertainment team, uh, managing the strategic uh, advertising relationships in the UK between Facebook and all the major broadcasters, so BBC, ITV, uh, Channel 4, Viacom, UK TV, News UK, and Vice. Uh, and he's also a member of the IAB's Video Steering Council, so I'm sure he'll give us a, a perspective, uh, a more wide perspective on video. And then finally, we have Adam Davies from Cinemedia, uh, who's a project manager uh, there. Uh, Cloud-based cloud video and media solutions, uh, previously worked at Thomson Reuters, uh, News International in Cisco, and is an expert on, on th all things cloud-based technology for content media management. So I'm going to start with a very short opening question uh, so we can try to understand uh, how paid for has developed in the, in the space. So I'd like to go around and say, how many SBOT services do you subscribe to? I sus subscribe to four, of which I use one and a half, and my kids the rest. And how much time <laughs> per week do you spend watching them? Uh, like uh, any suite, roughly half of half, my total half time. Half of your total, total time, wow. Christian? Um, I subscribe to four from two different countries. Um, but because you were talking about the UK stuff earlier, um, from a recent uh, piece of research we did, the average US household has about one and a half. One and a half. Stefan? Yeah, so I'm actually one. So it's yes. I have Virgin as my TV, and I tend to use Now TV, but even then it's rather than a subscription kind of pay-as-you-go basis just to top up news and sport when I need to. So no free delivery, no Amazon? No. no. <laughs> Nick? Um, two, so Netflix and Amazon, and uh, my kids probably take up most of the, the viewing time Fair and four. Four? Four. And because I'm a, I'm a rugby fan, and if you want to watch rugby in this country, you've got to go to the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, S4C, BT, Sky, Premier Sports. <laughs> it's actually harder to find the game than it is to play in it. <laughs> <laughs> So this is why this panel exists, because of exactly that reason. You need to go to six different places to watch one sport. Excellent. So I think let's get straight to it. So what does the audience picture look like? So what are people consuming nowadays, and what is the mix between paid for and ad funded? Matthias, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Sweden. Yeah, well, it's, it's great to be back. I was here one year ago and discussed the developments in Sweden. In Sweden. I mean, we're at the stage where we are uh, approaching half of the total consumption in Sweden being OTT driven or on OTT uh, and obviously in the OTT world th there is a, a higher share of uh, pay TV uh, pay TV content and as well if you look at the ad funded it's a much more complex picture than we're seeing in the linear world so I'd say uh, and looking at your interesting figure we're, we're a year or two ahead of that uh, this year we're going to be posting a roughly 8% decrease in linear viewing uh, but the good news, I think, for everyone on this panel and the room is that the total consumption is growing uh, in Sweden. Is that mirrored in other markets? Christian, what's your experience? I, yes, I'll get to that. Okay. But, but really interesting to hear you talk about 50% because just I'm, I'm not American. I just happen to live there and know that market very well. But um, according to Nielsen's latest numbers, 12% of viewing is OTT in the US. So that's quite a significant difference. Yeah. 
um, which I find really interesting. That, that's the legacy of having Spotify, Pirate Bay, and <laughs> other guys uh, yeah. starting out of our uh, country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the overall watch time is growing absolutely. Um, as we've heard multiple times over those past few days, the vast majority of that is on the big screen. The hierarchy of screens remains absolutely intact. You watch it on the best screen available. Um, and, and I mean, that's one of the reasons why there is so much or consumption is growing is because TV is better than it's ever been before. And there's more of it than ever. So, so and, and in terms of paid for and not funded, do you think again? So it's sort of similar to what Matisse I think said. it's, again, really interesting in listening to the vocabulary because I, I still, be, well, not I still, I believe that we're using different words in different places. Okay. Um, as it comes to the UK, for example, we would not call Now TV an SVOD provider. We would call it a virtual MVPD mm -hmm. because it starts with linear and then you get VOD as well, which is what you get from cable. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting if you, if you look at that dynamic. Um, the penetration of... Um, Netflix in the US is, is huge and um, where your numbers may have been slightly misquoted on the UK market, in the US that is very much true. It is Netflix plus something else. There are very few people who have either Amazon Prime and use it for video. There are a lot of shipping people but and use it for video yeah. or Hulu. Um, so it's, it's, there is definitely money going into that market but if you go into the model the, the Hulu model in the US, which we've also seen in, in TV2 Denmark just now, where you have a limited ad tier and a no ad tier, 80% of their subscribers are in the limited ad tier. So mm -hmm. if you have that conversation, if you, if you have that discussion with your audience and they make an informed decision, I think there's room for both. So why, why are we kind of subscribing to these services that don't have ads, Stefan? Do you think there's a rebellion among consumers against advertising in general? Um, I think it's quite interesting in terms of, you know, if you look at ad blocking, I saw some um, e-marketer stats saying that, you know, 22% of UK internet users actively ad block, and I think 21% um, download an ad, block, ad block but don't use it, so it's not this kind of huge thing that I think maybe a couple of years ago um, everyone was kind of really panicking about. I mean, at 18, for 1824s it went up to something like 43%, mm -hmm. but in terms of active ad blocking, going out your way to get away from advertising, you know, it, it's, it's there, but it, it's not huge. Um, but yeah, I think with these kind of OTT services, you know, Netflix and Spotify Premium, it is just got a kind of really easy, passive way to ad block. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's one where we are going to see, you know, as these kind of hybrid models come out with, you know, ITV's already got ITV Hub Plus, Channel 4 launching next year, you know, there will be that option for a certain percentage of, of um, consumers to just easily take the advertising away. So, Nick, would you agree? Do you think that we are moving away from advertising? And what does that mean for ad-funded platforms? Um, yeah, I think the notion of saying there's a rebellion, it feels too much. I think that I, I don't believe that anyone, <coughs> the way consumers, all we think about content is think, I can't wait to go home tonight and watch an ad-free, paid-for, SVOD content. I think people just don't think or, or kind of say, say those things. So I think it's much more about, you know, there's an episode of a certain show on Channel 4 or Netflix where it was it's just kind of dropped and it's like, what's the easiest and quickest way for me to get to that content? I don't think people really at this stage massively think about whether there's advertising around that or not. I think um, from our point of view and I guess from the kind of where Facebook sits, we certainly see in the digital and the kind of mobile space that when ads are around those experiences, the more relevant they are, the more powerful. And, and I think there's a level of expectation of consumers and people that there should be more relevant experiences in terms of ads. But I certainly don't think that it's, um, it's a conscious decision by consumers to say that we're going to rebel against ads and you know, we're only going to kind of stick to content where there's, there's hardly any ads. I just don't believe that's a, that's a thing. I think we kind of saw it in your chart earlier about the reasons people use SVOD and it's all around you know, access to original content, flexibility of viewing when they want to. Um, you know, I don't think that, that there was even an option on there about to avoid advertising. So it's still definitely led by the, the content rather than... Yeah. So, so how many more Asbot services can there be? We have Apple launching next year. We have Disney Plus launching next year. Uh, you mentioned the, the, in the US it's 2.3? It's, it's, one it's one and a half one on half, average, um, which includes 70% of people who don't have any. Right, so, okay. Um, I, think, I think they're going to launch, um, but I also... I want to remind people there's about 500 SVOD services out there in the US, um, and the number of that is shrinking. Um, uh, Time Warner or Warner Media is launching a big one, but they've just shut three small ones down, right? So there's, there's an aggregation that's happening. A lot of the little ones that were out there had massive 
only positive content deals because people found ways of monetizing content that was sitting around. When those come up for renewal, if there's an actual commercial model behind it, that may not be feasible anymore. So, and from a consumer perspective, um, it's really funny, despite the fact that people keep talking about, oh, I want to pick everything I want, they really want re-aggregation of stuff. That's why Amazon Channels is an incredibly successful model, because you get a single bill and you can opt in to individual things as part of that, right? Um, so from a consumer perspective, I don't think there's going to be seven big ones that are going to survive long term, but I think there's certainly room for that type of number in the medium term until it starts falling out. But um, it, it, it's, yeah. a change, <coughs> sorry, it's, it, it's a change in the landscape then. Mm -hmm. you know, we're nowhere Hopefully. near where the end game is at the moment. Um, by the end of this month, there'll be over a billion subscribers of some kind of pay TV service. So, you know, it, and there's more people watching more TV on more devices fundamentally. And that means there's going to be more inventory. There has to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a discussion yesterday, I think it was Lorne who talked about the opportunity for, for that inventory, because there is going to be highly fragmented. So the challenge is, is to make sure that we can somehow unite that inventory and also build the right value for it. Mm -hmm. So we know the first, the first ad insertion in a VOD is, is the critical one. Everything else you're going to fly through. But pretty much everybody has to watch the first five seconds of that, of that insertion. So the, there's a lot more opportunity there. And one of the things that's kind of struck me about the whole conference is we talk about advertising in, in Western Europe and North America. Actually, look at, look at what's happening in, in Asia. Look at what's happening in India. Reliance launched a, a mobile platform two years ago. They're adding 10 million subscribers per month. And every subscriber has got access to a to a VOD system. To an on that. amazing VOD system. Yeah, that yeah, we all have, yeah. <laughs> and and how's it funded? It's ad funded. There's, there's a premium service which you can subs subscribe to. Um, but you know, we're talking about marginal gains in in India. There's a potential audience of quarter of a billion. I think uh, yeah, we'll get to the advertising. Actually, it's my next question. But uh, sorry. Uh, and and I think one of the things we'll reflect back upon in a couple of years now that now we're trying to divide it between linear and SVOD pay and add and so on and so forth. I mean, that's our construction of a market that for the viewer doesn't make sense. I mean, they want access to content and they want to be able to choose when, where and how they consume. So I think this how many SVOD services is a question in, in a couple of years is not that relevant, to be honest. Okay, so actually that was going to be my next question. So when will we find kind of stabilize? Because at the moment we, we're still, as you say, launching new ones and quite big ones, you know, and, um, as you have demonstrated, as Christian from TV2 has demonstrated, and as ITV is going to do next year, we're getting more and more SBOT services. So when will we sort of stop launching these new SBOT guys? Is it going to be stabilized in the next two years, as you say? We're still launching linear channels around the world. So I don't think okay. it'll ever stabilize. There's always going to be changes. Okay. It's just about how we aggregate. Yeah. Excellent. So Adam, you started already. So, uh, you know, you're, you said, I kind of already answered the question perhaps, but does paid for mean fewer opportunities for ads? Uh, and I guess your answer is sort of not necessarily. Yeah, like I say, yeah. Yeah, the, the, there's more inventory, um, but, it, but it is highly fragmented. And, um, you know, one of the other themes of, of this event has been how do you, how do you bring collaboration into that business when you've got multiple vendors? Um, and it's not really a technical problem. It is largely a business problem of getting everybody to kind of work together. But the, the opportunity is there to deliver a better experience for the, for the subscriber. Again, go back to the... So how, uh, do we, how do we solve that business problem if it's just a business problem? Um, so there was, there was, <laughs> you have an answer. <laughs> there was, there was um, uh, Simon Thomas uh, on this stage yesterday yeah. talked about data being like oil. And, and he was absolutely right, apart from it being kind of sticky and smelly. Um, I, would, I would actually say it is sticky and smelly <laughs> yeah, it in is most sticky cases. And, actually, and, and really hard to get to. Um, but to kind of stretch the analogy, you know, you've got to drill for it, you've got to bring it to surface, you've got to refine it, you've got to manage it, you've got to process it and deliver it. And that's how you get the value out. It's not just about grabbing everything we can, but making sure that we're, we're able to provide insight on the data. And again, if you had a lot of people talk about data and analytics, very few people talk about insight and, and action on that data. And that, that again, is, is where some of the tipping points are going to be, is how those, those providers can actually provide insight to drive a better experience. Sky is doing it, obviously, with AdSmart. Mm -hmm. 
I think one, one, one important point on the same topic, I mean, we're, we're in, in, a, in a market where uh, TV is booming, linear TV is growing 6% this year. You're talking about revenue uh, now. Revenue. Yep. Uh, AVOD is booming, uh, growing 25-30%, we're growing at double the pace. Uh, however, when I attend this conference, I, I, I also conclude that in, in my market, this discussion has moved on from data. Because, of course, data is extremely important. A and uh, a couple of years ago, we acknowledged that, we addressed the issue, and so on and so forth. But when I look at our market, data is extremely important, the discussion is important, but uh, the discussion is more and more about the context where you get your ad. And that discussion, I, I, to some extent, I miss a bit uh, dur during this conference because, I, as rightfully pointed out, in the digital world, it's a much more complex setting of uh, advertising opportunities. In the linear world, you had the big screen, it was a, a linear feed, and it was a 100% completion rate, and so on and so forth. In the digital world, that's not the case. In the digital world, you have a whole range of different screens, different completion ratios. I mean, it, we have to move this, the discussion beyond just, okay, who can uh, provide what data and start looking at, okay, but what kind of impression are you really getting? And it's intriguing because if you look at the academic hotshots of our world, the Byron Sharp, the Mark Ritson, the Karin Nelson, what are they targeting on right now? I mean, they're back to the basic. Does anyone see the exposure? And, and, and that, from my point of view, is the next discussion that needs to be had before we can present a, a more useful picture to the advertiser. It's not only about who provides this, and, uh, provides this and that data. It's about, okay, what kind of exposure comes with that data? And in my world, as an adver uh, advertiser, that's the first question you're going to ask. And I then you can start worrying about the yeah, data. Ju just to build on that, I think, um, it certainly sat firmly in the digital camp. I think just clients can sometimes get, and, and agencies, and everyone we talk to and get obsessed with just all these data points about and what does it mean and looking at viewability and looking at engagement rates and all, all, all the thing, all the manner of things you can look at. And I think actually what we try and remind people of is, you know, bring it back to your core business objectives and what is the reason you're advertising anywhere in the first place. You know, if you're a retailer, if you're trying to sell shoes, how can these data points help prove that this activity has driven something towards selling those shoes? Or if it's, in my case, talking to TV companies about trying to get eyeballs to, you know, to shows and people to watch more programs, how can data points you know, kind of become proof points to show that we're actually shifting perception towards shows? So I think um, data is, 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 is interesting really key, but I think it's the, the, the double-edged sword with digital is people get so obsessed with all the data points you can read, and I think often just can't see the wood for the trees and forget why they're, why they're advertising there in the first place. Is, is a bugbear of mine. So as we do have a resident buy side representative, and I'm sorry, Stefan, but you're the only mm -hmm. uh, yeah. buy side representative here. So maybe you can actually tell us what customers, what advertisers do want, and what do they expect to gain in digital, and what, what do they think they're going to lose? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely um, kind of agree with Nick's point mm -hmm. about that it's your objective for video campaign is always going to be a business result, whether it is you know awareness, sales, consideration. Um, and I think you know, we do have a lot of uh, kind of metrics floating around in the kind of agency world where, um, you know, we're looking at different KPIs for different channels, but I think a lot of the time they are, they are just a kind of sense check or a health check to get to that business result because I think it's quite easy to start off with, oh, I've served some impressions and I've delivered this business result without understanding how that's happened and why. So I think we use those KPIs as more of a, a health check for those um, kind of ultimate business objectives. Um, I think with that data, you know, if, if we're talking particularly about the TV screen, it's been hard to overlay data historically. And, you know, we are seeing that in the UK with things like AdSmart now. Um, and at Group M, we have Finecast as well, which is, again, trying to not, you know, uh, to um, Christian's point in the last presentation, not to kind of have this kind of either-or situation, but let's take all those benefits of TV around viewability and start to kind of make our targeting more intelligent. Um, so I think, yeah, ad advertisers expect that that data gives them targeting, that it gives them some form of measurement, predominantly of business results. Um, but I think, you know... Ab but then the context element that Matthias is talking about is, I assume, also a consideration. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think, you know, advertisers are, are, you know, intelligent enough to know that in this kind of fragmented market, they are going to lose some reach on TV. And it is hard for us to 
be able to, to kind of measure that. Um, you know, dovetail, we're talking about probably Q4 next year, Q1 2020, and that, that will be just the broadcaster element and won't include um, a lot of other kind of digital video. So we're back to using tools and models and, you know, in, in the same way that agencies always have done. Mm -hmm. So we have a tool called Touchpoints that looks at holistic reach and frequency across all media channels, including TV, radio, out of home, print, you know, those impressions in each of those channels aren't necessarily equal in the same way they're not equal in the video space, but it's a, a kind of statistical tool and model <coughs> to model reach and try and you know, recuperate some of that lost audience from linear TV. Yeah, I, th I, think, so I think that's a really interesting point because one of the biggest areas of, of digital media is actually podcasts. And yeah, they've got an amazing completion rate. Um, they've got, got great engagement. And and are delivering advertising and barely any measurement and barely any measurement exactly. Well, and yet, according to our kind of preliminary data, I yeah, think the, these things last for one on average. A day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but they're they're lasting forty five minutes. Uh, a lot of them are linked to TV shows, and mm. that, that, you know that's it. So you you know the audience, you know what they're doing. They're probably watching the show and listening to the podcast on the same device. But the, there's no commonality of measurement. It's back to the effort again. It's back to to that fragmentation. But being able to at least start gathering those data points and then building the intelligence on it. So actually, you can run a unified campaign across a podcast, which is related to the show that you also want to run the same campaign for because it's attracting the same audience. That's where we've got to get to, and that's where you can start delivering real value to the consumer as well because then they're getting something that's engaging for them that they're interested in, and it's going to keep them fundamentally using your services. Which nicely, sorry, if I can add, pick up on one thing you said, um, and that ties nicely to that as well, is that what we do talk about but don't talk about is the fact that the more video consumption moves into an ad-free environment, whatever that looks like, that means your impressions in general in the market are going down. Mm. That means, as a marketer, you still need to sell, say, send the same message, means the prices are gonna go up um, because that's just the rule how it works. So that's an interesting way as well um, to think about it from a, from a marketer perspective, if I put myself into their shoes, I'm actually interested in the, the ad-funded video environment flourishing because it gives me what I need in order to achieve my business objectives and all that type of stuff, right? So, so Matthias, is that how you turned around your TV ad decline? You just put prices up by launching an asphalt service? Uh, <laughs> No, well, it, it's uh, maybe a bit more complex than that, but, but uh, Christian's got a fair point. I mean, it's a perfect market in the sense that demand and supply sets the price. And if you manage to increase the demand uh, by, for example, looking more at the quality of the impression, comparing uh, auto starts with no auto starts, sound without sound and so forth, uh, advertisers will put the premium price on those that kind of inventory also in the digital world that deliver those kind of, of impressions. So it's a lot about having the discussion with the market, with the agents, with the advertisers about what you're actually getting for your ad advertising money. And they will see uh, a lot of money uh, shifting from YouTube and whatever and whatnot into broadcast AVOD. At least that's what has happened in our market. So Christian, just to pick up on your point, fewer advertising opportunities, surely that means that broadcasters have to start thinking more creatively about how they can advertise or market. So what, for example, at Viacom... You mean we ourselves uh, so or yeah. for our clients? For your clients. Okay. Um, well, yes. Um, for us, um, with the, the history and legacy that we have in our relatively youth-funded brands, notwithstanding Channel 5, Colors in India and Telefe in Argentina, um, we've always tried to do that. So it's always the brand integration. It's, it's, it's beyond sponsorships is how can we do that? But for us on top of that, what that means now in an, in an environment where video content or stories, we're storytellers really, um, are so much in the zeitgeist and all that type of stuff. It's, it's also extending that into the off screen environment. So we're launching our second Nickelodeon hotel this year. Um, we've got mall experience centers, um, MTV branded music events, all that type of stuff. And all of that in, in addition to all of the things we have on multiple screens, the big screen, on the app, on whatever else, um, and our own SVOD services, um, you can now extend that into the real world as a, our partner as well. Um, and, and how all of that plays together is definitely still playing out, but 
that's where we, we hope to apply um, the, the more creative thinking as well as how can we, how can we link a, an advertiser brand or a brand brand with a piece of content with our brand and make that travel together, including into the spaces where there are no 30 seconds ads around it, right? Yeah, and, and so that's my frictionless viewing experience. Mm -hmm. that, that's, I don't care where, where my rugby match cut is coming from. I just want to be able to watch it. Mm -hmm. And once you can start delivering the frictionless viewing experience, you can deliver the frictionless ads as well. And to a point, this is, this is where the collaboration really needs to start coming in because um, because then you're, you're, the service provider is working together with the advertiser and working together with the broadcaster because they're, they're aggregating different data points, building that insight. And then just as I don't, don't really mind which channel or, or which provider I'm engaging with, it's going to be the same for the advertising capability. And, and for you on the buy side, that's going to be much easier as well because it's, it's audience. That's what you want to get to. Well, is, it's it, just is it easier though? Audience. What does that mean for your planning? How then do you go about planning in, in this kind of fragmented? Well, like, like I said, it's, yeah. it is extremely complex and fragmented, yeah. and we, we have to essentially use kind of tools and models to, to get there. Um, and you know, those tools, as I said, is about you know valuing those impressions by different media types, and also within video, using the data that we do have. So some of those kind of media KPIs that I spoke about earlier, they can inform how we value impressions along with econometrics data and, and kind of business data. Um, but yeah, in terms of creating a, a holistic video environment, I mean, we, we are starting to see collaboration from the UK broadcasters. Um, and a, again, you know, something like um, Fine Castle working with all the broadcasters to bring the, the targets into the TV screen. Um, but you know, are we ever going to get to a completely frictionless point where we can go and plug into every video source? I, like you know, we're saying the, the kind of commercials behind that and the the, the business models that sit behind these, it, it's probably not going to happen. So, but you know, as, as an agency, that's where we we add value for clients is by working you know up a video strategy to navigate this space, um, and then having the tools and the measurement in place to try and understand how that's worked for our audiences. But yeah, it's, it's extremely complex to, to do. We have sort of addressed the same uh, objective, getting to, to this fantastic world where you have all uh, the video in one place, but from, uh, we've addressed it from a different perspective. What we've put a lot of effort into, into the last two years is actually making linear and digital meet. Before putting our focus on having all the digital video inventories and uh, meet from, from our perspective, our AVOD has much more uh, common uh, ground with linear TV than it has with some of the other video inventories out there. So, I mean, our, our prime objective is to make uh, linear and digital AVOD linear uh, as a holistic buying experience for the advertiser. Because, from our perspective, that makes much more sense than putting our effort into making our AVOD compatible with YouTube or, or Smart Clip or whatever and whatnot. For, for coming back to, to the, the discussion beyond data is that it's very different products you're selling. And to some extent, linear TV has much more to do with AVOD TV than AVOD TV has to do with uh, clips on a news site in a, a small sticky player in the corner, which is out to start it without sound. And that's, so that's exactly, where we're going. And that's exactly what we're seeing across Europe, certainly. And I mean, even in the UK, or I don't know, even, um, all four, or Channel 4 being the, the starting point to that. So there's a lot of energy around that because 100% agree, you're watching the same content on the same screen. You don't care what pipe it powers it in the back, right? It's the, that's the same thing. It's 100% of the screen, it's all the sound on, all of those types of things, which makes it very different then a whole lot of other video inventory. And Alani, just gonna wanna go back to one of your previous questions about the kind of creativity piece, so yes. how our kind of clients sending out, and I thought it'd be interesting to just to touch on some work we do with YTV here in the UK. So working with us, they you know, look to promote a lot of their shows on our platform, so you look in Facebook feed, Instagram feed, and you'll see adverts for, for new shows. And the question I had to ask is how can we you know, help viewers, how can we make it easier for viewers to kind of remember when these shows are on? 
So working with a what we call an FMP, which is a Facebook marketing partner, like a third-party creative studio, we created a simple execution that, sat, that sits within Messenger, Facebook Messenger, and it essentially created this, what we call a Remind Me a bot for Messenger. It comes to you from ITV. So you see an ad for a show you like look of, and the show might be happening in, in say, three weeks' time. You can click two buttons to set that reminder, and then an hour before that show starts, you get set a personal prompt from Facebook Messenger from the ITV reminder bot to say, hey, your show's about to start in an hour's time, remember to tune in. So I think, you know, for me, utility is really key in this. If, if you can offer something back to a person, if there's a bit of a value exchange within that kind of ad experience, if there's a really simple kind of utility or simple thing that you can, you can give back to a person or the audience, I think that's a really key thing to, to, to cut through or in this really cluttered uh, ad space that we're seeing in, in, in this new world. I think, uh, what, what Sky was talking about uh, again yesterday, both at the, the CEO session with Stephen, Stephen Van Royen and uh, Jamie session, um, where they were showing the, the ease of access to, to those attributes. So I remember coming to this show six years ago, seeing the AdSmart demo, and there were, I think, 200 attributes at that point. Now there are 4,500. Do we need that many? Um, we probably do. We probably need more. Because, because of the kind of fragmentation we're looking at. But it's about the ease of use. Yeah. Yeah, you know, to, to work with 4,500 attributes <coughs> 10 years ago would have been impossible. I mean, five years ago would have been pretty challenging. But, but now if you can aggregate those into, into different groups, it's about being able to split them up, but also then provide the aggregation back. And I think the way that Sky are, are being able to do that and, and simplify the process, which is a very compli complex process, then I think the industry can start looking at that and, and start building on, again, that kind of collaboration. It's easier for Skype because obviously they're a, they're a single provider, but um, there's the opportunity there to bring all of those things together and bring a, build a, a frictionless back end as well as a, a frictionless viewing experience. I'm going to come to the audience in just a little bit. I'm just going to ask one more question. I want to touch a little bit on the growth of connected TV uh, viewing and just get your thoughts on kind of, we talked about paid for versus ad funded. What is Connected TV? What kind of complexity does it add in terms of finding uh, customers, in terms of finding uh, audiences for advertising? Well, well to start with, uh, and uh, we saw it in one presentation this morning, uh, it's good news for advertisers that uh, a lot of the inventory is consumed on, on uh, big screen because that provides you with the best opportunity to, to impact. We heard Christian, he had 75% of his inventory on big screen, I have 50% of our AVOD on big screen. So I mean, to start with, it's good news that, that uh, big screen is, is a major uh, screen also for, for OTT consumption. And then it comes with its drawbacks when it comes to dynamic ad insertion and so on and so forth. But, uh, but uh, for, for us, it's good news. For the advertiser, it's good news. I, I would agree. It's completely good news. I would add one thing to the, the not so good thing is that it adds a lot of cost particularly talking about connected TV sets as opposed to a Roku, a Fire, an Apple TV box, because there's so many different operating systems on there, which means you have to develop your app for 50 different ecosystems, which is where I think there is one of the massive opportunities for collab collaboration between the broadcasters within a country, across countries. Um, and I always go back to this example of the international radio player which came about because the car manufacturer said, I'm not going to put everybody's app in a different country into this thing. I'm going to put one thing in there, pick one. Um, and that is one of the ways that you could do that on a TV set as well. No idea how realistic that is, um, but it's something that certainly within a country, it should be feasible. We're hearing particularly in the UK, those conversations around Kangaroo 2. Um, I find it interesting actually that all of those conversations are, are about the SVOD side of it. Um, I think about it from an AVOD perspective, because if you put iPlayer and Hub and all four and My5 together, you have a pretty compelling offer for a consumer. But you also have very different business models. Different business models, but that doesn't mean that the technology at the back end has to be different. I'm not saying that everybody, like the BBC content can still be ad free and ITV can still sell their own ads, but you can do that on a, on a United Tech platform. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> On that note, I just want to check in the audience if there's anyone, any questions at this point for our panel? And please help me if I, I can't see it. Over there, we have a lady in the middle. If you can just wait for a microphone and just tell us who you are. There we go, they're behind you. 
Hi there, my name is Laura Chibi, and I'm from Middle East Broadcast Center, NBC in the Middle East. I'm going to throw in a little bit of a red herring, and it's around creative production costs. For television, it's about 14%, and it's about 7% in online. So the, the quality of television advertising is double when you look at the investment. In my region, the money is being ripped out of production costs, and it went into influence and the power of influencers. And there are influencers, there's a report out by Business Insider that says an influencer with 8 million followers can charge as much as $250,000 for a single post. And while we're sitting here saying is SVOD cannibalizing AVOD and direct consumer models, I'm actually wondering what's your point of view on all of the advertising dollars that may have turned into marketing dollars in a form of agility being spent on the power of influence. And before media used to be the influencer, and is that still the case? Who would like to give that a go? Well, there, there was a discussion yesterday on um, legislation around this, because, because you're right, it, it, it's advertising. Um, and the example was the, the Iceland ad, which wasn't allowed to be shown on, on broadcast TV, and yet is, is generating something like eight, 10 million impressions on social media. Uh, and you're right, that that's advertising. And again, it goes back to that, that fragmentation. I think there needs to be um, a little more control on some of that. And you know, I know Facebook are doing some things around that as well. Um, but again, if that's, if that's going to be classed as, as advertising, we need to be able to measure it and start adding value to it. Do you find influencers are cannibalizing your TV ad budgets? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's one budget that is being spent. I think uh, influencer marketing is where maybe digital was 10 years ago. Now it's, it's extremely exciting. Everyone is trying it out. And at the end of the day, you'll find out where it works and where it doesn't work. So I think it's a lot about uh, getting a decent structure where you actually can measure the results. Yeah, I mean, to give you some context, the media agencies I speak to say their clients will give them 10% of their total budget as non-capital expenditure that could be used for influencer marketing. Mm. Yeah. So it's a big chunk, it's, it's not small. I would also add to that though that it goes both ways as well because there is below the line stuff, particularly retail promotion money, that type of Wait stuff that yeah. moves into targeted ads, right? Um, so the, the more targeted you get, the more all of that, the more opportunity you have to grab something from a pot that didn't used to be advertising. So it's. Yeah. yeah, and I guess from a kind of Facebook point of view, you know, obviously we have platforms that help fuel in some of it, some of this new movement. But um, I would also say that we're still huge fans of just great, solid, kind of traditional creative work that lives on our platform. Hence why we have kind of a team in something called Creative Shop that are kind of there just to, just to kind of make that happen. And a lot of that work still will start with a great looking kind of TVC, like a TV spot. And then a lot of the hard work is then just trying to tweak that and edit that and make it just fit for purpose and, and fit for mobile. So. Yeah, our big, you know, belief is still that, you know, great creative can kind of sing across many different platforms. It's just a way of make, treating it in the right way for different, for different platforms. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Okay, in that case, I'm going to ask my last question. I was going to ask you about what percentage of uh, viewing was going to be ad funded, but it sounds like that's not the question I should be asking because it's all going to be uh, mixed. So instead, I'm going to ask you yesterday, Alex Mahan from Channel 4 said that she's quite excited about connected cars because potentially we're going to have more opportunity to engage audiences with more video. So I was going to ask you what next technological advancement is going to disrupt ad funded viewing? And I don't know if, if anyone, do you want to start, Matthias? I mean, the, the boring answer is, of course, uh, voice control and the way that's going to be an interface between us and the users. Uh, but on a different note, we are in the process of being acquired by, by Scandinavia's largest telecom company, uh, pending uh, approval. And of course, if you look at all the touch points uh, different companies have, there's a lot of opportunities where you can add uh, uh, video impression uh, as a part of a business model. I, I would agree with that and also come back to the India example earlier. I think um, consolidation across mobile or mobile operators or all that type of stuff, it's in, in I'm going beyond Europe for a second, but pay TV penetration in Europe might be relatively high, in the US very high, in a lot of parts of the world, minuscule. But what does everybody have is a subscription to some sort of a mobile service. 
So that gives you an additional or a different path to the consumer. And I think that's an interesting way um, to think about how we get stories to the people. Stefan? I think in the next kind of year or so, it is, it is going to be addressable TV. So actually, if you look at the amount of kind of addressable TV impacts at the minute, it's something like 0.5 to 1%. It's quite high. So it's, yeah, there's still plenty of headroom to growth there. If you look in the UK, you obviously have Sky AdSmart. Um, I've mentioned Finecast, but there's, there's still plenty of headroom to growth um, in that. But well, with the Virgin integration as well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I wouldn't be the person for Facebook if it wasn't going to talk about AR and VR as kind of the potential hey, future. Hey, we're going to see stories. Uh, <laughs> but I do think, you know, even actually in this market, we've seen, you know, some really big traditional broadcast uh, companies kind of dip their toe into ex kind of exploring uh, kind of AR as opposed to VR. So I do think as phones get smarter, as they get you know kind of faster, I think AR is going to bleed more into the kind of the, into the mainstream. And I think that again, if back to your question of what could detract away from kind of ad funded viewing, I think and, and then obviously you know, AR will be the first thing, and I think the next kind of frontier that will be the kind of the VR space. And I think the more that comes on, becomes more of a mainstream thing. Then again, it's going to be interesting to see what that does to attention and, and kind of where people are viewing content and how then ads and ad experiences are kind of baked into. Into, into those experiences as well. And finally, Adam? 5G. 5G. 5G is going to do it because it's going to give to a connectivity to everybody uh, and it's going to open up all of those new markets. Uh, you know, again, Western Europe, we're kind of spoiled. We've got pretty good connectivity, unless you live in Surrey like me. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 will, it will enable value added services, um, two way services, S4 services in the other three quarters of the world that don't have them at the moment. There's, there's an audience of another six billion out there waiting, just waiting for advertising. Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you so much for a fascinating discussion and well done on not answering the same thing as each other for the last question. That was very impressive. So if you could please join me in thanking a fantastic panel.